Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to Secret to Success episode 5. This time I have with me Grandmaster Abhijit Gupta who has many achievements to his uh, to his uh, you know bag and is five time Cornwall champion, world junior champion. He is Arjuna award. He has uh, won so many tournaments. So welcome welcome Abhijit uh, to this show. Thank you so much Kartik for having me. Yeah and uh, Okay, I, I wanted to start with your childhood and all, how, how you started chess and so on. So, how mm-hmm. did you start chess, uh, like who taught you chess and how did the interest uh, grew uh, slowly? Uh, so, like uh, in the beginning, it was uh, very strange for me because uh, I was not meant to play chess. But, uh, you know, like uh, as Russians, like in Russia, they say that the, you don't have anything else to do uh, as playing chess because of the weather. So, somewhat similar happened with me also because it used to get so hot in the summers, like during the summer vacation. Uh, so, I was like, what else to do here? Yeah? So, I started playing chess just because of the weather. And in the beginning, like, uh, my dad used to play chess. I mean, play chess in the sense that uh, he used to enjoy, like, you know, having a game once in a while. So, he started playing, he was playing with somebody and I, I don't remember exactly. So, I came to him and was like, uh, you know, I, I want to learn it too. I want to play with you. And he said, no, no, this is not a kid's game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I re- still remember that. And and then I uh, I got some, I found somebody, you know, from whom I can, you know, learn. Uh, so, we, like, we, we, we went to a... a a bookstore or something like that. Uh, we bought some books and we started learning on our own. And then, you know, slowly, like the interest developed and like, of course, like my, when my dad saw later on, like how I was playing, then he took me, you know, to, to various places. So that's how I started playing chess. So generally, like uh, until very recently, I used to think you are from Delhi. So and recently only I found out that you are from Rajasthan. So yeah, yeah I'm from uh, Rajasthan. Yeah. In more Rajasthan, more than yeah, in Rajasthan, there are not many players, right? So, uh, how did you manage to uh, like uh, get into like good uh, good player and like how did you manage your chess and all? Uh, I feel in the beginning it was very difficult. I mean, I didn't really realize it, but I could sense it now, you know, because like how how my parents struggled for it to find a sparing partner or find a coach for me. Uh, I still remember like when I was like 10 years old, 9 years old, you know, I used to just stay at some place, you know. I mean, in Rajasthan, there are not many chess players, but there are still some, right? So, I used to just stay at their place, you know, for, for a month or so and just, you know, do do chess, that's it. And uh, so, it was, it was a difficult time, it was tough times. But yeah, later on, like, I still remember, I used to get like good breaks because uh, uh, there was one... Uh, international master from England, like Andrew Webster. Uh, I still remember I was probably around 10 or 11 and he came to play this Commonwealth in Bikaner, which was in 99 or 9, 2000, I don't remember exactly. Somewhere around that time. And he came to uh, to that tournament and somehow like uh, my dad managed to convince him that, you know, I am somewhat a decent player and uh, he should train me or something. So, uh, he started training, not training me, but like also visiting this Rajasthan. I mean, there is there is this another advantage of living in Rajasthan is that people want to visit the place because it, it has this its own heritage value. So, he used to come to my place just to visit around and I used to show him around. And like in return, he used to, you know, not train me, but he used to play some games, he used to analyze. So, that had a good thing on my uh, understanding. And then he even, you know, uh, took me to England like once uh, <clears throat> where I could, you know, play all this British Open when we Indian could play. So, yeah, so that had a good <clears throat> impact on me. And then I think right after that partnership was there, I also formed a partnership with Anup Deshmukh, international master. Uh, he was also like... Uh, gem of a person like uh, used to come to my place or even when, whenever I used to go to his place, he never uh, used to charge me anything like at, at the beginning it, it was a little bit awkward 
but then like as i even said before in like different interviews like it was uh probably at that time you know if uh, he would have done that to me like how he behaved with me and like so nicely behaved with me uh, probably like oh, that also makes you a person like not bes- besides a chess player you know like it all- Vishal Sir has made a huge impact on my life so I always used to get like uh, good people around me so that sort of helps and especially like when you were young uh, how many hours did you work on chess like and what did you focus on like especially like working with anup sir or uh, vishal sir and sir like how many hours did you work uh so anup sir i used to work a lot like in the beginning i don't remember the timings but like uh, i still remember he was very strict about physical activity so whenever i used to get up doesn't matter 9 10 like i used to go and have a run in the morning and then we used to just start working you know if if uh, i if he has office probably he'll go to the office and come back and he give me a task to finish and uh, yeah it goes on like that uh, with vishal sir also it was the same thing uh, in my early days i remember like working a lot uh, i think it is uh, yeah you were saying something yeah you go on go on okay. i worked a lot like uh, eight to 10 hours but also it, it it never felt like work you know because i was sort of enjoying it like you know watching all these games analyzing them and it was sort of a new thing for me so yeah and like what did you focus on like uh, there are so many aspects right like openings calculation in games uh, and other middle game concepts so what did you focus on no. most of your time i don't think it was so uh, like you know uh, it was in any conceptual based uh, chess it was just chess you know like overall chess understanding so we just used to analyze games we just should play games sometime learn something some op- new openings but it was never you know that today i'm going to see some opening today i'm going to see some end game it was never like that it was basic uh, understanding of uh, your overall chess that time and like even these days you know like people ask me ki my son is good in openings my son is good in end game i was like he is too young to be good at anything first of all and secondly you should not teach chess like that first the kid should have overall base and only then you will realize like in which portion the kid is good and then you might want to focus on that yeah right. and did did you have any goals or something like before playing a tournament or generally when you are a kid did you have a dream of uh, becoming world champion or becoming a grand master or something like that yeah i think as a kid like everybody would want to become world champion so i i did that too uh, like i had that dream as well yeah and before the tournaments like uh, what what is your expectations normally like when you are kid and also nowadays uh, like how do you mm-hmm. set goals do you go just to win the tournament or uh, how is it yeah basically uh, which are tournament i compete in i want to uh, at least be in top 3 like or tie for for something like that is my always that is my goal and uh, my point is always like people will always remember the champion you know there's no one else going to remember second or you know any of the places remaining i mean it doesn't matter if you have gained 20 rating points it doesn't matter if the second prize is paid this much or that much but people are only going to remember you if you become uh, the champion of the event <clears throat> so yeah i still feel the same thing like uh, wherever i compete i mean if i'm not competing for the first place then it sort of uh, uh, i don't get this same motivation you know like uh, if i am already uh, you know i've lost a couple of games and i know that i i'm not competing for first place then the motivation level really uh, goes down for me <clears throat> and did you have the same attitude when you were young uh, just starting or uh, just like when you were 10 12 like did you have the same attitude or uh, did you have any different attitude 
no no the same all the same attitude always because <clears throat> the very first event i played like very first like chess event was some club level event i mean and i managed to win it and then i played i won that the very first nationals i played which was under 7 i won that so you know i was, I was like oh this is good you know like if i can win like so easily i mean if this is meant for me and whenever i never used to you know uh, perform well like even during a tournament so you will see like there is a mixture of you know performances in my career like if i'm playing well i can even gain like you know 20 25 rating in a single event but if i'm playing bad i can also lose to 25 rating in, in an event so for me uh, if i'm not close to winning a tournament or if i'm not in the race then it's most probably i'm going to do very bad in that tournament but if i'm in the race then okay i'll i'll i'm more motivated to do even further like, like uh, uh, you know to further uh, uh, improve my performance yeah and uh, like how did you like choose the tournaments uh, generally like uh, before and also now how do you choose your tournaments like which tournament to play and which not to play and so on <coughs> before to i don't exactly remember probably my dad used to do it when i was a, a kid and then later on like probably uh, vishal sir and i used to discuss like what to play what not to play but it was uh basically uh you cannot really say that as a chess player you know ki you can decide your own tournament sometimes the organizer has to agree like there are various factors goes into i mean you know yourself and uh, like nowadays to you know the, like there are some tournaments which you want to play you you're getting my point right like some tournaments you are comfortable in like you have played those event before and you like the place all those things right yeah, yeah. so there are some events like that like for me iceland is one of them like playing in delhi is like another thing so yeah these four or five events always like are my in my calendar and yeah these other events like normally i would like i like to play all these strong opens like uh, gibraltar air of float and all these big opens where you get to play against uh, really strong players so me basically i like to play in a tournaments where i'm comfortable at like i've been to that place i don't like to you know visit new places necessarily yeah and also like yeah. uh, how many tournaments uh, should one play like some people okay including me play more than 20 <laughs> tournaments a year and <laughs> yeah yeah and okay no i'm i'm, I'm definitely sure that is not the right way <laughs> but uh, no but you you play you play uh, but i mean whatever suits you you know because i also remember uh, when i was like 15 16 uh, i played about 20 or 22 events in a year yeah so but it was very taxing for me like back in that day it was very taxing for me so nowadays i play like in between 12 to 15 i mean whatever feels comfortable for you because you know at some point like there are there are some, some time periods where you don't have any tournament you know for like couple of months but then you also have like periods where you play back to back like for four five events so i mean it totally uh, depends on you, you uh, how your fitness is because people don't understand that we, we need to have a decent fitness to you know play back to back events because it's it's not easy to sit on a board like for five hours i know in your case it doesn't matter because your game finishes in two hours <laughs> but yeah yeah and yeah you were mentioning about physical fitness like generally okay so i also didn't use like i didn't uh, put that much focus on physical fit- fitness so generally what would uh, your advice be to the viewers and uh, generally like uh, how much f- focus should they keep on physical fitness and what do you do for physical fitness by the way uh so i i feel like general physical fitness is good enough like i mean if you're running like just run for half an hour in a day you don't have to be extreme you know like uh, uh you know some people who are like constantly training uh, like 2 3 hours a day but yeah half an hour one hour is it should be good enough like normal like a normal human being you know 
and like i do the same thing right now like uh, i i've got some machines like in my house with where i can run where i can do some different type of exercise so that's what i do uh, these days as well i mean even a one hour walk you know every day is good enough as a, to to be a chess player and also like on mental fitness like some people do meditation but uh, i don't think many players just uh, chess players like do meditation and all they're not that disciplined so do you do meditation yeah. and stuff or uh, how do you <laughs> keep mental fit no i i think it's all a big myth that you have to do meditation and uh, we have to be mentally very strong to be a chess player uh, i think it's all a myth uh, i was doing before like i used to do meditation before but uh, i didn't find it too effective maybe i was doing it wrong uh, so i didn't find it too effective maybe for some people it is but for me it wasn't so i just completely stopped it but uh, to mentally fit like to be mentally fit in the sense uh, of chess uh, for me it's better to solve some puzzles you know so that your mind is running rather than uh, just sit there many daydreaming 15 minutes i would rather have a position in my mind to solve in those 15 minutes than to just sit still and like okay uh, like especially i have seen you in delhi like uh, not only in delhi but generally you are very calm like i have never seen you like uh, i mean not angry or you know frustrated like you are always calm even when you are not playing well and so on so how do you keep yourself calm and uh, what is your advice to general audience uh no actually when i'm not playing well, i'm i'm not exactly calm like maybe from the outside world it feels like i'm calm but inside i am sort of you know i want to punch the other guy <laughs> but uh, no but like i feel uh, uh, it doesn't really matter like uh, at the end of the day it's just a sport you have to take it uh, as it comes uh, of course you will feel bad losing and you will feel happy when you are winning but if you can keep the same emotions for uh, you know uh, at both the events like winning and losing it will ha- it will help you improve as a person so uh, like recently last few years i have i have consciously made made this effort you know where not to feel stuff like after winning or losing if i played a good game then i'll feel good if i played a bad game i'll feel bad but not like when i'm winning or losing of course it's is easier said than done like even if, now if i'm losing a game even in blitz i feel bad and if i'm you know swindling somebody in a blitz where i'm completely lost and then i have won a game i'll re- feel really happy but you know it's it's a ongoing process and you can never get away yeah, with yeah, it right. and also like uh, generally like there are there is so much pressure uh, during a tournament sometimes you need to uh, win some last round games and so on and you have won many last round games in order to clinch the title especially like this year delhi open i was there and uh, you beat alexandro in the last round to win the championship so how do you deal with pressures and so on like especially last round uh, games or and also like sometimes uh, before norms uh, before scoring norms mm-hmm. you will get that pressure right like so how do you handle that uh, pressure to be honest it's uh, uh, it's just by experience you know you have said like many last round games i went i won to clinch the title but i've lost many last round games also to lose the title <laughs> so it just goes with experience it like uh, there is no again a perfect process to it that you're going to do this to be not nervous during the last round game i mean everybody gets nervous even me and myself like uh, like in delhi open last round i was not really nervous uh, before the game or during the game but once i got a good position i started getting nervous so this is very natural it happens to everybody just my advice would be you know just keep calm in the sense that whenever you're feeling like you're getting nervous just take a small breaks you know like one minute break 30 seconds break go have a walk have tea coffee have a sip of water so that's that's my motto in general like have break for like 30 40 seconds and then start uh, uh, focusing again and how much do you focus on uh, results or something like uh, and also do you keep track of your rating and norms and so on like uh, in 2006 you scored your first norm in andorra open and then second norm in mm-hmm. parshvanath open 2007 
and last one mm-hmm. i think you scored in spain so were you focusing yeah. on the norms and rating and all during those times uh i'll be lying if i said no yes i was i was uh, focusing on norms uh that time and especially like once you make your first norm people sort of expect or you yourself sort of have this expectation okay uh, one norm is finished okay i'm going to finish the tile very soon right so uh, every time it's not like i was playing bad but it was there in the back of the mind okay you yourself know okay you need to beat certain players and you need to draw against certain player to make a norm right so that was there in back of my mind as well so i'm not going to deny that but i think overall it's not a good thing because ideally you don't want to just stop at becoming gm right you want to go further so this is just a road block this is just a, like milestone which you achieve in your career and then you have to go further than that so if there is there are any young players who are like just you know obsessed with achieving norms and all don't do it because uh, it's just not worth it you know going for norms here and there and then you know taking too much pressure on on yourself to achieve certain miles of course it's good uh, but if you if you are focused on uh, if you focus on you know improving your play then this norms will come automatically and you talked about like uh, general attitude towards tournament and let's come to the rounds like uh, during a round what do you think about like do you uh, like uh, think about winning the round or do you just uh, like your attitude is to play good moves and then uh, just go with the flow you mean during during the game or yeah during the game? the game during the game to be honest during the game i don't have that many thoughts like i'm mainly focused on what the position is like how the game has developed so during the game i just focus on that and that's about it like sometimes you can make emotional decisions in the sense that uh, when you're playing weaker opponent you want to uh, beat them no matter what like no matter what the position is but yeah mainly i just focus on the game like whatever is in front of me that's a great attitude and like uh, generally once in delhi uh, me deepan anna and you were there and we were speaking about uh, like generally you told me that uh, whenever you play against 2700 or someone you don't you're not scared at all but you are uh, kind of uh not scared but you don't like to play against this lower rated players like 2300 or 2400 so why is that and uh, how should one uh, like face higher rated players what attitude should they have no i think uh, you shouldn't be scared of because i feel this is it's a privilege i feel it's a, it's an opportunity because uh, let's say if you beat uh, somebody stronger like really strong player uh, it's better for you it's better for your career because even though if you haven't played the game well uh, the game itself you know like will be more popular the game itself will get more publicized all those things and also we are here not to of course we are here to win tournaments we are here to win games but we are also here to learn right so how do we learn how do we improve by playing stronger players it doesn't matter if you win lose make a draw against anybody as long as you are learning so that's my primary focus like if if i'm playing against anybody if i'm not learning then it's not i'm not doing something right so that's the reason why i like to play against higher rated players because i know for sure i'll be able to learn something after the game and like you know during the game maybe or you know after the game when i'm analyzing with them uh yeah so th- that's why i like to play against higher rated players and it's low rated players not like i dislike it it's just that the constant fear of uh, you know uh, the result <coughs> and it's not like <coughs> i completely dislike it uh, because in open you have to win few games to you know to reach a certain level in the tournament so yeah that i mean that's the only reason it's it's very result oriented which nobody should uh, do but still at the back of the mind you know it's always there okay if i'm even driving using four rating i'm reaching using three rating Yeah. Somehow, you know, this has been instilled in our brain like for so many years that it's difficult to get away with it. And also, like while playing higher rated players, some players, you know, play for a draw from straight uh, first move. 
so what would be your advice to those players like uh, should they uh, have the same attitude or should they change the uh, attitude and play for a win you mean if you're facing a higher rated opponent yeah higher rated opponent no i i think this is uh, this is really bad like i i personally have never uh, you know played like that against whomever i've played like when i've faced higher rated opponents because as a player how are you going to improve by competing and if you don't compete against the people who are better than you then what's the point of playing the game if you're only competing against uh, the players who are weaker than you then of course after a certain you will not you're not uh, improve right so to to improve from to the next level you obviously have to compete against the people who are better than you who are like sharper than you who has like better progress all those things and to do that you have to compete you, you just can't make you know quick draws and come back and say okay i've gained like two rating point and do you like any time did you fear any opponent or someone uh, or uh, you never feared anyone no 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 uh, it's a sport yeah it's not going to kill me so what is there to uh, worry like it's just a chick it's just a game so yeah i take it like that yeah and once okay i was playing world junior in turkey and uh, i was i think 6 uh, out of 7 and i was playing param maksudlu the mistake mm-hmm. i did was i watched lot of his videos where he said that he used to work for 20 hours and suddenly <laughs> i got uh, this fear in my mind uh, that i'm going to lose whatever so generally what would you recommend to those players like sometimes uh, they can't have the atti- same attitude so if they are feeling low like what would you recommend like how should they approach the game i got this advice like very late in my career but it works actually so it doesn't matter whomever you are playing let's say magnus carlsen is the best player in the world right now okay so if you can face him you can face anybody right so let's say on a chess board if you make a move he's not going to make two three moves right he's only going to make one move correct yeah so at a time he, you will play one move he'll, he'll play one move you will play another move he'll play another move so at a time you can make only one move right so that one move most most li- likely you will also consider yeah because that's the best move you will consider so what is there to fear you know like he is he is not a like super human that he'll make like two three moves for your one move he'll play one move you will play one move so that said that's a simple you know mantra yeah and like Uh, but okay generally like whenever you are facing continuous failures and also like recently uh, you came back to 2500 i think last year or somewhere and like how mm-hmm. do you generally deal with failures and uh, what would your recommendation be uh you know it gets difficult like i'm not going to deny that you sort of feel depressed you know like especially after having a bad tournament when you come back and when you don't have anything uh, planned you know like in few for few months let's say i played a tournament i played badly and i don't have anything lined up for another month you'll be depressed for a while because you cannot perform like uh, in next event because there is nothing lined up but uh, i feel you should not really think too much about the results uh, you should uh, go for you know uh, you should have learning goals rather than result oriented goals a learning goal as in like okay in this certain amount of time i'm going to learn this thing in that another 15 days i'm going to learn certain thing and then you try it out in tournament so once you do that for like for some time like for 6 months 8 months a year you will see like in one year you have you know from from where to like from this to this you have learned so much that after a while result will automatically will come but yeah like failure it's always difficult to deal with i deal with differently than many other uh, chess players like <clears throat> i i tend to like eat, during a tournament i tend to take a lot of walks so you know i just used to physically exert myself so that i can sleep because if i cannot uh, i mean if i'm not exerted enough if i'm not tired enough then i'll be constantly thinking about how i lost the game uh, in the same sense like uh, it's also bad because i'm thinking too much about the result but sometimes you can cannot just help it you know like normally i'm calm cool you know composed but sometimes you have to do such things because let's say if i am 
if i have lost game you know in a completely winning position i mean i i'll not really mind losing a game if i'm just losing from the start if i'm having slightly worse than i i lost that game but if if i lose a game from a completely winning position that would actually uh, uh make matters worse so usually those days i like to exert myself and then just you know uh sleep because that is the biggest problem whenever you lose such a game it's difficult to sleep because those things comes back to your brain and also like la- in the last episode i am saron and also said the same thing that uh, vishwanath and anand uh, like whatever happens if he loses he just goes and uh, exercises for one hour or so in order to forget about the game and uh, it's like a routine that he follows so that's yeah really great advice i guess and uh, like coming to the chess part like we have focused on mostly psychological and attitudes and all so let's come to the chess part like you are an uh, i would say opening expert uh, i've read your uh, new in chess yearbook articles and all you wrote uh, couple of articles not every uh, like i read uh, the one on richard roger and one i think in slav you said it black is the new white or something if i'm not wrong so i read the, mm-hmm. those two articles so were you uh, good at openings from the start uh, from the start of your career or did you uh, improve after a point mm. to be honest i don't feel like you know i'm good at openings right like even now but uh, i just feel like these are the things if you just constantly work on uh, it's not that hard to improve so for me it is as a chess player like you know if you are teaching some young kid or something uh, where to you know focus your time i would still say you know you know you should focus your time on middle game end game because openings are such things you can always learn you know and it's not like okay today i've learned something it's that is there with me right but it's also going to change openings are like that so yeah like openings are things which you can always improve on and it's not that difficult to learn openings whereas middle games and end games are i think are more difficult and i would still advise everybody to start with that and okay eventually of course you have to learn openings but you should not be the priority like if someone uh, like th- they are quite good at middle game and end game and they want to focus on openings so how should one improve their openings like let's say i want to learn uh, grandfield for example how should one mm-hmm. start studying the opening and how should they build the repertoire uh, i feel this is uh, very easy so let's say as you pointed out grandfield so i would just see uh, who's a top player who's playing this opening constantly so in this case uh, swidler probably he plays this all the time so i just check out his games what he is doing for different different lines and yeah then build my repertoire accordingly and uh, like uh, d- like how to look at the specific variations and so on like uh... i think in the beginning you don't have to like uh, like lot of us just go deep into one line but see we are learning openings not uh, you know for a particular opening like we are learning chess try to think of a as a bigger uh, try to take it as a bigger picture we are learning opening just because we want to improve our horizon of chess right so if if you think like that then you will not go into detail very soon i mean going into detail is very good in general but uh, i don't think it's it's too useful you know in the beginning so i would probably just look at it like you know overall let's say i'll just uh, look at the the opening as like you know uh let's say if i want to play tomorrow i would rather look everything you know little little rather than i will go into deep into one line and uh, okay nowadays okay many strong players especially at your level they are, they are using uh, this cloud engines or they are building like a good computer at home so what is your mm-hmm. opinion on cloud engines uh, do you use them regularly and if so like how to use them properly uh yes i do use them regularly whenever i am working on chess uh, i don't know it's like simple like how you're using your computer engine the same way you're using your cloud engine uh, but i feel 
uh, you should not rely too much on engines, like too much on computers. You should still try to find ideas on your own. Because uh, first of all, <coughs> if you're using too much engine, you're not going to remember those lines during the game. And secondly, whenever we are, uh, you know, analyzing stuff, we are analyzing to improve our understanding. So if you're using too much engine, it is not helping for our understanding. So you should not use too much, but yeah, I mean, at a certain level, you have to, to prepare openings and stuff, but that's like, you know, necessity. Yeah. And uh, like someone told me, I don't remember who, but um, they told me that you have separate databases like Chesme's uh, magazine articles and you have separate database for uh, correspondence chess and you have separate database for every single uh, I don't know, for yearbook or something. So is that true? And mm -hmm. uh, if so, why do you do that? Uh, you mean I have separate, like, mega database separate yeah, correspondence separate? Yeah, you keep separate. updating every week. Like, once Chessbase magazine article comes, you just keep update, uh, you just update the database and so on. So, so if that is true, why do you do that? Like, why, why it is separate, something like that? Why the databases are separate? Yeah, or why the database I, 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 and like um, like why should one focus on like there were most of the players just use mega database and they don't care about mm -hmm. the other databases. So why do you keep track of all the databases and uh, how important? Is okay, so why 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 it is separate is that I mean because I don't know why it is. I mean like it's been I mean it's been inbuilt for me that okay this should be put here this should be put there. It's like when you are setting up your cupboard, not all the clothes you will put at the same place, right? You will put your shirt at such different place, you will put your pants at different place, it's like that, I feel. And uh, why uh, to update? Because, I mean, if you don't update, then I don't know, like, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to this question, actually, <laughs> to be very honest. It, it is like, it comes so natural to me that I feel like everybody should read. What is the point of this question? Anyway? <laughs> like, so, yeah. Many players, like, uh, like even some of my like uh, friends who are grandmasters, they just uh, use online database, uh, maybe a little bit of correspondence. They don't focus on no. this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, it's, it's completely fine. But, you know, sometimes I feel uh, this online database does not have games. Uh, like, I feel uh, there are some games missing. So that's why I keep uh, updating every database separately because I, I've experienced myself, like, uh, when I'm just doing with online database, I'm missing some, some games. So, so that's why I keep everything handy. And... It doesn't take that much time, like, you know, it takes like five minutes in a week to update your databases. So, <laughs> and okay, there are so many articles and books on opening. So let's say I'm playing Grunfield. So do I need to keep track of all the databases? Should I buy them? Uh, and should they uh, like, should I keep track on uh, what the people are recommending and so on? Uh, my suggestion would be no, because then you will be constantly uh, buried in this opening work, you know, like Grunfeld is one opening, maybe you are playing 10 different openings, then you are constantly just, you know, seeing that only. So my suggestion would be if you are happy with the preparation, then don't do it, like you just have this confidence, okay, if you have analyzed this, then okay, it should be good enough. And if you don't have this confidence, then of course you have to... Uh, go check it out all these databases which are coming out but eventually you have to understand that you can't rely on different people analysis because you're not really learning anything you're just uh, you know memorizing the moves and stuff so to improve as a chess player you have to analyze yourself you have to uh, you know constantly uh, reinvent yourself and how do you do that by analyzing yourself so yeah my suggestion would be like don't uh, go too much you know you have to get this database that database if you are confident in your own abilities to analyze stuff then just do that and like i had uh, like i had this question from long time but i didn't know whom to ask it may like you can uh, if you want you can skip the question also like generally um, strong players hire seconds and all like i have this question like how much do they charge and do they charge for hour or something <laughs> Uh, it, it depends. Uh, yeah, they 
seconding is a tough job uh, uh, like i remember like uh, ganguli used to say like when he was seconding anand that uh, they were working like for 15 16 hours in a day i don't know whether it is true or not <laughs> but he used to say that so it is a tough job and they used to get like uh, decent money uh, you know out of it because if anybody is working for 15 16 hours they should at least get some money out of it no <laughs> <laughs> and do you think like uh, keeping a second uh, like let's say you have become a im or gm then uh, is it good to have a second or uh, like just working on your own is fun i think uh, in the long run like when you have to, see seconding if you have a second the only thing that person can help you is is openings right sometimes you don't have enough time to you know work on certain things so that's why second chart good but in the long run it just makes you lazy you know you'll say okay this guy is ci is d like i don't believe in the concept of seconds but yeah at a very higher level at very high level where you know you have reached your peak you cannot improve further then of course hiring second it, it's good because you keep you get a lot of work done but before that i think my my general concept of working is not like working on openings mid game end games is not like uh, i have to get certain work done my concept of working is i want to improve so how do i improve by giving my work to seconds i cannot right so so that's why i feel maybe at a higher level yes but i don't think at current level like even my level i don't think uh, seconds are that important and coming to like weaknesses and all like everyone has weaknesses so how should one find the weakness and like when you are young or uh, even now like how do you analyze your games and find out your own weaknesses uh you just analyze your games i mean how do you analyze you just first of all very important thing is uh, whenever you are analyzing your games you have to be very objective it doesn't matter like whomever you are playing against you have to be objective about the position so if you are objective to this position if you are objective to yourself then it becomes easy to you know where you made the mistake and also another important thing is you have to know how much you are thinking on a particular moment like so still like i feel like people should write the time like not in you know, on every move like every five moves ten moves or particularly where you have thought like let's say 10 minutes or more than that so if you are doing that then it helps you to analyze stuff better because certain move you play like certain, you have made a move which is actually not good and you will also think you will also see that you have thought for like more than 10 minutes so these things can you know uh, help you analyze uh, your mistakes because sometimes when you when you think too much you make a mistake all these things can but again the main thing you have to be objective objective about your mistakes i mean you cannot just get away with it because if you're objective with your mistakes then okay you you will uh, you will definitely improve and like analyzing the game there are uh, like generally two methods uh, which people usually use like they just analyze with uh, a computer and uh, find out the mistake and uh, some people suggest especially classical players they suggest to work uh, analyze your games over the board and uh, like then maybe check it with engine so what do you think is the best uh, way to analyze a game I think first you should analyze on your by yourself I mean by yourself I mean not with the engine but like let's say your opponent like when you're analyzing your game with your opponent that is the best time to analyze the game you're fresh like from the game coming from the game and you also understand your opponent's perspective where he's coming from like why the certain move was played in a certain position so you learn a lot while analyzing uh, with your opponent and I should say I should like you know Point out to everybody: It doesn't matter you win, lose, or make a draw. Always go and analyze with your opponent because that's the best time you can learn something. And yeah, coming back like okay, once you have done that, then okay, you can put on engine and okay, assess where you have gone wrong. But you first have to put your own thoughts in, like okay, why you have played a certain move, why you didn't. I mean, maybe you missed something. Why the certain move was missed. like all those things and then only then uh, uh, use the help of uh, engine and uh, okay after analyzing let's say i find out my weaknesses uh, let's say my weakness is uh, like technique 
so how do i work, uh, how should i work on my uh, weakness like uh, what should i do like there so again like in a day like there are so many things to work on tactics and maybe some other things as well so how should i allocate my time to work on my weakness i think once you become a grandmaster main time goes to openings right yeah. so or even before little little before that but uh, i still feel uh, you should always focus on your stronger points more like for instance like if i if my technique is good i'll still focus more and more on that uh, because the most of the games i'm going to win it because of my strong point not i'm not going to lose many games because of my weak point correct so if i can focus more and more on my strong points that is beneficial and the other thing is how to improve on your weaknesses is like same thing if i am not very good at technique then i like if i'm not very good at technical play i'll start seeing those games you know like people like karpov carlson like even fisher like once once they uh, get this advantage then i will let it go i'll start seeing their game i'll start analyzing their game from a certain point and yeah eventually you will improve it i mean it's not such a difficult task main main difficult task is to understand what is wrong in your play and you, i mean unless you're not being objective there as well uh, again it cannot happen so yeah i think main task is to understand what is your your weakness and be objective about it yeah and yesterday okay i just uh, saw a couple of uh, minutes of your uh, stream on this petrosian game uh, like you were doing mm-hmm. uh, doing it for an academy so first of all like uh, classical games uh, what is your inf- like how classical games as a, uh, as uh, help do in your career and like how mm-hmm. important is it to study classical games uh i think it is very important <clears throat> uh, especially like in my case like uh i've grown up you know what like seeing my slow like seeing tas all these great guys uh, games in the beginning like in my childhood and why it is important is is for a simple reason like basically what we are doing right now we are doing research thing yeah when we are analyzing openings like we are basically researching okay why certain move was played why we have to play a certain move and if you don't know your past you know if you don't know why a certain thing was played why this plan is being played out why is, let's say i'm your opponent is playing in a certain way why this is happening so those why if you haven't answered yourself in the beginning then you cannot really come up with the answer for the future you know so that's why i feel seeing classics are like must yeah and like okay the there are so many ways to look at a classical game uh, and also mm-hmm. like how to choose a uh, like particular player let's say uh, there are so many world champions who are great players and also their uh, uh, players who are not world champions but still their games are must watch so uh, uh, mm-hmm. like do you select a particular player let's say caspro and look at his games or uh, do you just look at uh, random classical games uh yeah in the beginning like if you're starting at this topic then i would say that it's better to pick a player and then see all his games if you've already seen some games then probably it's better to find a book like uh, let's say for instance like all this kasparov's book my great predecessor is really good but i mean that's not it like there are like many more classics than which was which are there than covered in any book so i would still say you know just pick a particular player like as you said like kaspar and start seeing his games one by one and like while looking at his games like uh, should one guess the moves or uh, should they just play through the uh, game and uh, just analyze it with an engine no 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 there is no point of analyzing with engine if like uh also I, th- there is one thing which i forgot to match, mention is that uh, when you are looking at classics it's better because uh, see when two great players are playing it's very difficult to understand uh, why a certain move was played but let's say when kaspar was playing against some random guy you know some lore related there then the moves he'll make you will understand because he is going to carry out those plans okay but if let's say kaspar was playing against kramnik you will not understand why kaspar played a certain move because kramnik will obviously see that and he will do something against it yeah true. so so it's better to see those classical games where 
you know there is some difference between the two players and what was your question again i forgot i, I also forgot to <laughs> let <me>. okay <laughs> no I, I, what was i saying okay i think it was on uh, in, like how to look at a classical game yeah yeah so yeah it more or less like this i feel is the most beneficial when you see a classical game where certain player has certain advantage over the other player uh, yeah. yeah and basically see the games where with the results i feel uh there are mo- many things uh, i mean there are many games where with which ends in a draw but still has like lot of beautiful things to learn but it is going to take up too much of your time yeah i feel first you finish that with the results with the games with the result and with a, some sort of difference between the players and then if you have time then go through everything yeah and uh, coming to like uh, the uh, like i asked uh, this question to mr saravanan as well so like what is your mm-hmm. take on uh, passive training versus active training like uh, okay there are a lot of videos online uh, and also you also do videos for an academy and also uh, like chess base india or other streams so generally uh, how to combine passive training and active training or do you only recommend active training and stuff so passive training is when you are doing it i don't get it like, like what is passive, passive training passive training is when like you are just watching a video where your mind is not uh, like constantly calculating or you know trying to solve so generally mm-hmm. it is considered as a passive state where your mind is uh, just uh, not active okay 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 i understand uh, see for me passive training is like uh, you know i'm just laying on the sofa watching something it, it's more like it's not i will not say i'm actually working so this is like you know my free time i'm just putting some chess video and i'm watching it so i will not consider really consider this as work so in that sense yeah you have to be uh, your mind has to be active i mean why do we train like in the same thing to improve our game yeah you can't just improve your game just by watching stuff like there are some interactive lesson i'm not going to deny that there are some interactive lessons where you know uh there are some contents where you see uh, that you have to pause a bit you have to analyze all those things still i feel like the more you work on your own like by yourself instead of watching stuff uh, it's more beneficial for you rather than just you know watching some videos of course like there are guys like you know when sudler is talking when kramnik is talking you have to watch it because you can learn many things from that but that should not be your main thing to improve your main thing to improve is to work yourself not you know just to watch this can be your secondary uh, a way of learning chess yeah and uh, like coming to end games i always ask this in my streams because like if everyone says to do end games then i will also start doing so generally what is your take on uh, theoretical end games do you solve i mean do you constantly re- refresh your memory with uh, theoretical end games and so on to be honest not really like uh, end games are one thing which if you have learned it well it it stays with you forever so of course you have to learn basic end games where you know some for instance like you have to know by heart like how to win this how to make a draw against like h and f pawn in a rook end game so like these kind of things you know like if you if you have learned that then it's it's going to stay with you forever and no i don't feel you have to refresh it constantly i mean at least not in my case because i've learned it like at a, at a time like as a child so like it still stays still with me so no i i would not really suggest that to constantly refresh it. but like it's totally up to you like if you feel like uh, you know uh, you you cannot remember certain things then definitely spare like some time and go have a look at it but yeah like for me yeah it, it does not happen very often and also like uh, other than theoretical end games there are like uh, general end game play where uh, there is not like it's not theoretical end games basically so how should one improve that part end game play uh i don't know like basically just see the games of uh, the good end games player like 
Carlson is very good at it right now. There is Anderson, Ulf Anderson. So basically, go through Carpo was one of them. Fisher, I feel. Uh, so I would just say that you know take take their games one by one and start analyzing them and how they convert their advantage or how they play these end games. Yeah. And like, okay, there are uh, so many books that might have helped you in your career. So, like, can you name some of your favorite chess books and uh, the books which you recommend to general audience? I mean, if the uh, if you are already at the advanced stage of chess, then I would recommend all this Kasparov's book, The Predecessors by Great Predis Predecessors. Uh, yesterday, I was recommending this book of Petrovich, this Python strategy, which was also very good. Uh, the recent chess book which I really liked a lot of was Gelfand's book. Uh, not this series, but the first series. Uh, uh, I don't know. It was making. positional play. Uh, yeah, positional play. Yeah. It was. I find it very instructive. Uh, like even at at this stage, I thought like there are some things in the book which I didn't know. So it was very helpful in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, like generally, do you read a lot of chess books and so on uh, f- from your childhood? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. So many books. Yeah, yeah. I I do read a lot of books. I mean, chess books, non-chess books, everything. I I like to read. And uh, like coming to like you won uh, World Junior, uh, which I think very I think only you are the third person to win World Junior from India. So generally, what was your uh, like pre uh, pre tournament preparation? Were you expecting to win first of all? And like what was your preparation before the tournament? Uh, no, I was not really thinking about winning the tournament, but uh, like I was pretty serious about it. As I said, like even those days. uh which are tournament i was playing i wanted to finish like at least tie for first you know not if i'm not winning it myself but at least tie for first so that was my goal uh and i remember before the event uh, we had a long trip of spain i think uh, where they used to send you know the team uh to play tournaments like junior team sub junior team uh, the asa used to send like it by with the help of indian government so we just had a big uh, Tour there like for a month or so. We came back. We had a small camp. I don't know whether all of us attended or not because if we were anyway so tired of playing this event. Uh, but yeah, before that event, I don't know. My routine was basic, quite normal. I was probably resting a lot because I had a huge trip uh, before just before that. And yeah, during the tournament, I was like basically just you know focused uh, on my preparation and yeah, I was. Kind of focused, like even although my start was bad, I still felt like you know if I I give uh, myself time, you know not let go. You know sometimes if you are playing bad, you just let go. You know because you don't care anymore. So if you if I felt like this is a long tournament, like World Junior was like thirteen rounds even at least those days it used to be. So thirteen rounds is a long long time. So even even If you have a bad start, it doesn't matter. You always have time to come back. So that's what I did there as well. And also, like generally, uh, okay, uh, different people like the people uh, train differently. Some people like uh, daily focus on they work on tactics or they solve art puzzles before a tournament, and uh, uh, and, and like some people they don't even uh, prepare before a tournament. So, what is your uh, general take on that? Like, before a tournament, should one seriously work hard, or should they just relax and go play? Uh, it it actually completely varies from uh, like person to person. I mean, there is no formula to it that either you should work or you should not work. It depends. Like for me, uh, I'm a very slow starter. <laughs> like uh, for me, first few games are very tough. Like. If I don't get a good start, it gets very difficult for me to, you know, progress in the tournament. And I always, not always, but like, let's say, sixty, seventy percent of the time, I falter in the beginning. So, in my case, like personally, I feel I should be already in the shape before starting a tournament. So, yeah, I do uh, prepare, practice a lot before a game, not before a game, but before a tournament is approaching. 
but for some people it is not the case so i don't think you need you need to do it but it's like totally you know uh, up to a person and uh, like how do you specifically prepare against your opponent uh, let's say in this case um, you uh, let's take delhi open example you are playing against alexandro in the last round so how did you prepare mm-hmm. against him uh, so what is your general process uh, for preparing against your opponent see last round pre- tournament pre- play like, preparation are totally different because psychological also psychology also plays a big part uh, there i knew that my opponent will be always happy with a draw because he was leading by half a point he was and he was getting tired like he makes a draw so i knew if even if i burned all the bridges uh, he's not more most likely is going to uh, i'm going to get away with a draw anyway so also like in general like how i prepare is just i look at my opponent's game try to see what are his weaknesses uh, not not necessarily opening wise but his play in general like my opponent likes to play sharp positions my opponent doesn't like uh, technical positions so i'll try to choose my uh, openings accordingly and like okay some players uh, like uh, as you said like they look at opponent's games and uh, try to find uh, what they are strong at and what they are weak at and like some players mm-hmm. they just uh, pr- prepare mechanically like they just what uh, they look what your opponent is playing and like they generally see what i am supposed to play and they uh, they just go play so generally what is your uh, take on that should they look at opponent's games and find out the weaknesses and you know? no i feel uh, this is the this is a better approach where you have you where you look at your opponent games and try to understand you know what he is uncomfortable in in what position he is comfortable in so if you can do that accordingly you should select openings but okay there are also players who are successful players who just see okay my opponent plays this 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 maybe i can catch him in this this way and so and so and then go out and play that those things so it's again uh, up to a person but uh, personally i feel uh, if you can put your opponent to a test like where he is not comfortable in uh, you have won half the battle and uh, okay in 2013 if i'm not wrong you won arjuna award uh, which is one of the most prestigious awards for an uh, indian chess player an uh, indian sports person also mm-hmm. so generally how did you feel about it and uh, like were you so, uh, like how happy were you i mean i was okay it was it was a good moment but i was not over the moon or so uh, i think it was already I was I had been applying this award from 2010 or something, and yeah, then I actually completely lost hope of getting it because every year you know all these things, all these papers, and all you have to fill, and you have to you know you constantly have to wait if you'll get it or not. And yeah, I mean I was I was obviously happy. I mean while getting this award, it it was quite good because you were like you get it from the president, yeah. So you you are in our. Uh, in this president house and all those things it it actually feels good but i was not like over the moon because i had been submitting my application for like past 2 3 years so yeah and like uh, there is a photo where you sit next to virat kohli uh, when mm-hmm. you won this uh, arjuna award like i think mm-hmm. it is a quite famous picture and generally did you know virat kohli at that time uh, and like did you know that you were sitting against like the indian captain one of the best uh, batsman in the world and so on uh so your question is like <laughs> did i know virat kohli before and like no as in who is virat kohli or like yeah, or just, i don't okay it's uh, it's a normal question i uh, it was a short <laughs> question actually <laughs> So generally, I wanted to know, like, uh, did you know that you were sitting against, uh, sitting next to, like, uh, one of the best uh, cricket players in the world? No, I, <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that, but yeah, I did know that uh, uh, Virat Kohli was sitting next to me. Same way, he also knew I was sitting. I was sitting next to him. So, so yeah, and uh, you know, the funny thing is, like. During this award, you also have to do a dress rehearsals and all, and no phones are allowed, you know, inside this uh, president's house. 
so in the inside this rashtrapati bhavan so so a day before like we all are sitting like for one hour or so we are all doing this and funny like because the phones are not allowed you tend to talk a lot because uh, these days if you have your phone nothing no, nobody matters right like you just you constantly on your phone but inside there they take away your phones and so you have to talk so it's also good because uh, you sort of uh, build some relationships like because generally you are not going to do that yeah so you are there for like an hour a day before and then a couple of hours on the uh, on the prize giving ceremony so yeah and yeah coming back to your question yes i i did know who virat kohli was and the same i did know there are many people who were around me so yeah and like coming to commonwealth uh, tournament like uh, you win commonwealth uh, very convincingly whenever you play so what is the secret uh, whenever you play commonwealth there is no secret to it and there is no it's not like i win it convincingly as long as i'm winning it it feels sees like, like people see it convincing but it is never convincing i remember once playing in sri lanka where i had to win i don't know how many games in the end to win the title so it was not convincing it was just a fluke luck that i managed to win so many games but yeah it's in general like uh, as i told you like how do i select my tournaments there are few tournaments which you want to play constantly it doesn't matter how many times you played it or not like same with commonwealth for me like i feel uh, you know i'm more motivated there i don't know why and also like people are uh, you know less motivated to play against me in common for some reason so yeah that also helps yeah and also like there are so many tournaments like you said your favorite tournament is uh, iceland like reiko Re- Re- open and so on so yeah, yeah. generally like Uh, do you recommend players to play those kind of tournaments where you perform uh, uh, very well and like there's also this feeling right like uh, i have performed so, so well in uh, like so many times yeah i feel i feel it i feel it's like feel good factor you know like if you have played well at certain event you want to go there because all those memories are there that okay I, here i've beat a certain player here i've won a certain tournament so all these things uh, it's mean basically feel good factor i mean same thing you can also do in a different tournament like where you have played drastically like worse but you know it's, it's how you train your brain for me it is like as simple as that like okay i played well here so all those memories somehow plays in my mind okay so this is my tournament this is my event i like this place all these things you know Yeah, but there is also a pressure, right? Like uh, you are the Commonwealth champion for so many times. So generally, there is little more uh, pressure that you are supposed to win again. And and also there is also a little fear factor. Like uh, you have won so many times that there may something might go wrong, and there is usually this fear factor, right, in your mind going on, or you don't have that kind of fear. No, I feel uh, it is like fear factor should be more on my opponent's side. I mean. i've seen in, like personally that during these tournament they are more scared to play against me then you know that fear where you know i have to win again and you know yourself like during game all these th- thoughts don't come to your brain right so you're constantly thinking about your position what is happening what is your opponent is thinking all these things and these thoughts can only come you know before the event was it event starts i don't think it matters so much and again like uh i feel this sort of uh, thoughts should come to your opponent's brain more because if you have played well at certain point as a, at a certain tournament then they are more scared of you than you are scared of yourself and also uh, 2012 olympiad is one of your best tournaments in your career like you got a silver medal uh, in fourth board and also you had uh, I think two seven four six rating performance, which is like really great. So, what was your uh, feeling uh, representing India in Olympiad, and how, how did you deal with the pressure, or uh, how, how did you uh, like generally manage the tournament? Mm, the tournament is quite. It was my first uh, and only Olympiad which I played for India. Uh, so that feeling was quite good, like playing for India. And before that, I think. Uh, I also played in Asian teams, 
so i was sort of used to it now by now with the team and all because we were at the same team nations and then in olympia uh so i don't know it just it, i just felt very natural in it like playing in a team atmosphere uh also uh, like my teammates helped me like shashi in particular and yeah like there are some games like there where uh, i had to take a huge amount of risk to save the team like especially in georgia it was completely dead drawn game and i risked so much that i was even losing at some point but okay in the end i managed to swindle and win the game and these things i learned from shashi actually like who's like a true team player yeah. and also uh... okay he was mentioned i don't know if uh, adiban played there but generally uh, he was telling me like whenever uh, adiban uh, plays in your team it's always very harmful to look at his games was he playing in 2012 olympiad no no he was not playing okay <laughs> <laughs> no but <coughs> see adiban is a totally different character uh, you should not uh, look too much into his game but like whenever he is in the team it's uh, it's a good sign for the team because he makes the atmosphere so calm and relaxed that you don't have to uh, you know worry too much about chess if everything is calm around you then you are focused then be intense more yeah and okay you have covered most of the things so finally like um, we will have couple of audience questions and also generally what is your goal currently like after this covid situation uh, gets normal gets to normal what is your goal in terms of chess uh, uh, and also like generally you have started coaching so what is your uh, uh, goals in coaching as well uh to be honest i am not coaching that frequently so that coaching is still you know at the back side uh goals in general like still have this learning goals rather than this uh, uh result oriented goals where i want to learn a certain things in certain amount of time this is this is how i keep my goals uh so yeah and i'm like say in one year i will do certain thing i I'll, i'll keep like myself okay in 15 days i'm going to learn a certain thing and in the next 15 days i'm going to learn certain things and when you keep goals like this there uh, there is also sense of you know responsibility that okay i have only 15 days to do this and also there is a sense of fulfillment when you achieve those goals and if you make a goal like long term goal you know in two years i'm going to be here you are i don't know for me it never happens like that it, it feels a sort of stupid to me to have like such an extended goal if you have a small small goals obviously you're going to make uh, uh that long term goal also successful but important thing is to have a small goals in place and also there was one uh, audience question like you were mentioning about like for advanced player uh, you recommend uh, gary kasparov my great predecessor so he was asking mm-hmm. like uh, how to measure yourself like uh, how to know whether you are an advanced player or not how to know you are advanced player or not uh, I don't know. Just by playing game against some of the players, or by looking at your rating, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also like there is uh, okay. It's not a question, but uh, he was uh, Bharat Kalyan says that in his childhood uh, he studied your World Junior Games and uh, in Chessmate book, and also he saw some of he saw one of your Bishop D two Grandfield variation game, and uh, he was saying that he liked it. But I actually lost that game <laughs> in World Junior. This oh. Bishop Tito game, which I suffered a little. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> no, no, okay. Maybe you you got confused or something. I guess. So, yeah, no, no, it's fine. I'm just joking. <laughs> and like uh, generally okay some final questions uh, like uh, like other than just what do you do and uh, like do you watch some other sport or what do you do in your free time yeah because of this covid situation there are not many sports which is running but yeah i like to watch sport like all sort of sport tennis football uh, okay luckily now we have ipl going on so yeah evening goes there but yeah i like to watch sport like 
but in the covid situation the, the main thing was netflix <laughs> so that was my first time like during this time but yeah general i like to watch everything all the sports in general in particular yeah yeah and okay there some questions on like uh, uh, sleep and nutrition like uh, there like nutrition there are so many diets coming up uh, do you follow any diet or something and not necessarily but you during a tournament yes because uh, you have to be fully energized for your games and you should not feel too tired or you know too heavy or too sleepy during a game so yes yeah, so you should have certain amount of diet like at least during those 9 10 days if you're not maintaining uh, some diet throughout your life but like during those 9 10 days you have to have certain amount of limitations you know yeah and in your diet uh, yeah there are some extreme diets like ketogenic and all where the yeah. people don't take carbohydrates so much so what is your take on that and all like do you follow any kind of diet like that i don't think as a chess player you need to uh I've I've seen many uh, you know really really strong players who are like <laughs> eat all sort of stuff. So I I don't think that is really necessary for becoming a chess player or becoming a strong chess player. Yeah, and personally I don't follow all this type of uh, diets. I I like to eat healthy though, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that. Uh, uh, <laughs> to be honest when i said that my my, my wife was here and she was like oh, oh. <laughs> but like in, in general like uh, if you are eating healthy doesn't matter it matter if uh, you know if you are on a diet or not yeah and also like sleep uh, there are so many myths and all like but generally chess players most of the chess players i know they just uh, wake up at 11 or 12 in the morning and <laughs> yeah and like do you follow any sleep schedule or anything or you just uh, go with see the- see again again like it all depends if there is a tournament or not if i am in a tournament then yes i follow a certain routine like if there is a game in the morning then i tr- tend to sleep at 10 or 11 <coughs> or 12 match if there is a game in the afternoon i tend to uh, <clears throat> wake up late because i don't want to get too tired before the game if you wake up too early also let's say there is a game at 3 or 4 if you wake up at 7 8 then you have too much time away and you sleep and automatically uh, you know you tend to look at certain lies more and more so i mean it completely varies but yeah when you are not playing an event yes then i don't uh, have the sleeping routine i do have some routine okay i'm going to work at so and so hours i'm going to you know uh, exercise at certain time and all these things but no sleeping still still is the same like it doesn't matter like uh, i mean it's just that uh, i don't have a particular routine about my sleep especially like in this covid situation i changed my sleeping cycle so much like few some days i was uh, sleeping in the morning some days i was like again i got back to normal like sleeping at 10 and 11 in the night yeah it keeps on changing because there is nothing to do yeah and yeah thanks for answering all our questions <coughs> and uh, yeah it was very insightful uh, i i also learned a lot and hopefully also many people watching this but the, but this you but this you say to everybody so i don't know no no gen- <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, i i learn a lot from every single thing so and also yeah it's uh, like every journey is different from like different people like different people have different journeys and your journey is uh, unique and also you shared lot of your secrets and all and hopefully like some people can uh, uh, like emulate your like your training methods and all maybe they can improve their chess and so on so thanks for being here uh, it was so insightful and good luck to your uh, general chess and also your uh, like endeavors like an academy and many other things so thank, thank you thank you so much for having me i also had a lot of fun reliving all those you know memories <laughs> Yeah, that's what every guest uh, says, but <laughs> hopefully it's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. The thing is, like, uh, you don't uh, talk or think too much about this old stuff, your past, because it doesn't matter. Yeah, but like when uh, some people, like, let's say today, when you bring those out, it it sort of brings all those happy memories in you. 
and of course there are happy memories for a reason yeah it makes you happy yeah, exactly. so yeah thank you for for doing that uh, i had a good time as well yeah thank you for being and uh, hopefully we'll see you again some other time so thank you thank you again sure sure yes. okay. okay bye bye bye